The Nevada Democracy Project explores the modern day impacts of redlining in Las Vegas this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to a Nevada Democracy Project edition of Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon of Vegas PBS. And I'm Nyoka Foreman of the Nevada Independent. The Nevada Democracy Project is a partnership between our two organizations. And together we're holding community listening sessions to find out what we should be reporting on. We held our first listening session at the West Las Vegas Library, where residents told us that redlining, a discriminatory practice outlawed in 1968, is still hurting them. My name is Chandler Cooks. I was born and raised in this community. I'm 29 years old. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing Mr. Collins said earlier was the gift of exposure. Uh, that really hit home for me because we need that as, as, a, as a younger generation because we're going through a different way of life than you all did from coming here in uh, historic West Side. My father, my grandmother, my, my uncle's aunts, they were able to work a single job, purchase a home, raise their family, put money aside to send their children to school. Uh, I was a byproduct of, of that upcoming. But now, here I am, out of school, nearly $100,000 in student loan debt, I can't afford to purchase a home. I can hardly afford to maintain a home that will one day be inherited to me. Uh, look at that as generational wealth. My grandmother is a property owner on Jackson Street. Because of the red lining that she endured, it wasn't, there was no investment into the property. And now that I'm a, pro I'm a property manager for her, and that property will come to me. Still, you know, I'm, I'm in debt myself, you know, and how will I be able to maintain both of these things, you know? So, the trickle down, the fallout effect from the rail lining, you know, is affecting the next generation. It's making those opportunities far less reachable. You know, the freedom has been cut off. To better understand how redlining is impacting Chandler Cooks, we visited him and his grandmother at one of the properties he's expected to inherit. That story is ahead, but let's first define what redlining is. For that, we spoke with Richard and Leah Rothstein. Richard Rothstein wrote The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, while he and his daughter, Leah Rothstein, co-wrote Just Action, How to Challenge Segregation Enacted Under the Color of Law. Redlining is a very loose term. And what it uh, generally refers to is the uh, reluctance of uh, banks and realtors and developers to uh, provide housing for African Americans in low-income segregated neighborhoods. Uh, because in the 1930s, the, uh, the federal government drew maps and uh, colored uh, low-income areas, in particular those occupied by African Americans, red. And so that's where the term redlining comes from. But it's uh, uh, the maps themselves didn't segregate anybody. It was the reluctance of banks and uh, realtors, developers, to serve African-Americans uh, in, in segregated low-income neighborhoods. It also is sometimes is uh, used to describe the general policy of also refusing to serve African Americans in white neighborhoods, uh, so because the only place uh, you know realtors wouldn't sell to African Americans in white neighborhoods, and uh, therefore banks wouldn't uh, have the opportunity to lend to them. I was just going to add that yeah, the vague term of redlining is often used to encompass a lot of policies that were enacted by federal, state, local governments to not only determine where African Americans could get loans and could acquire housing, but then what those neighborhoods looked like. So, so it's often used to encompass all of the policies that then made African American neighborhoods areas of lower resource and like less investment, less um, 
gov fewer government services, you know, closer to industrial polluting um, companies and, and factories, closer to freeways. When the Rothsteins refer to redlining as a loose and vague term, we found that to be true in the case of Chandler Cooks and his grandmother, Ernestine Cooks. While Ernestine told us she had no problem getting loans to buy homes on the west side, that broader term of redlining, including less investment and fewer government services, would certainly impact her and her family. And this is my, my daughter that's on her way. <laughs> she, don't, <laughs> she don't believe y'all, yeah, because I told her I'm going to be a star, I'm going to be on the news. <laughs> Ernestine Cook says she began buying homes on Las Vegas' west side in the 1950s. A place for I have my family so I wouldn't have to be moving around because it was hard for black people at that particular time to get uh, somewhere. I mean, you can only live on this er in this area. Because of segregation, the West Side is where all African Americans in Las Vegas had to live in the 50s and 60s. The area lacked services like streetlights and paved roads, a problem that's persisted, says Ernestine's grandson Chandler. This road was just recently developed, right? But how long has it been in need of care, right? How long has many of the streets in this area been in need of care? Um, so I think redlining, you know, played a part in that as well. Still, signs of progress can be seen and heard. Renovations are underway right next door to Ernestine on a property Chandler says has sat dormant for 16 years. You know, like for the property next door, right? That being dormant for 16 years, you're not gonna find something like that in the Rancho Bel Air area, right? You're not gonna find something like that in more upgrowing and prominent areas of the city. So, you know, that and vacant lands, all of that lowers property value. Lowering the value on a property he's set to inherit from his grandmother. This fourplex and a three bedroom house nearby, he says are both in need of renovations, but with $100,000 of student loan debt, he just can't afford it. So, you know, I, I just have to, be innovative in, you know, how we would access capital to be able to improve the building. Um, but I mean, we're warriors, you know, my grandmother has been here for a long time. She's maintained this building, you know, to the T. So, uh, you know, I'm following her footsteps. Here now to further help us understand the modern day impacts of redlining are Shante patton Golar, a director of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, and Jennifer Young, director of community engagement at UNLV's Kirk Kerkorian Medical School. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanna start with you, Shante, and that story we just watched. What's missing from it? What might need to be further explained? I think it's it encompasses so much the black history is so rich and a lot of what we forget is how we got here um, and Richard did a great a great job of explaining that in his book but what we have to understand that the same government that attempted to save us and help us along is the same government that suppressed us along the way how so so one of the things is when it comes to appraisals, right? So there's only certain people who can become an appraiser, but it really stops black people who want to become appraisers from being able to do so. Since when it's, when it's said and done, you need to be an intern for an appraiser, but the majority of all appraisers are white men and in order to do that, they need to be able to take you on. So it's a roadblock for a lot of black people and black professionals who want to get into that field. That typically will bring us down to the part where we are buying high in communities, but we are selling low because of appraisal bias. And you have to explain appraisal bias. So typically appraisal bias is when appraisers will come in and they will value black homes and black communities lower than they would for a white community. And that follows with the trend of redlining as well. All right, okay. And Jennifer, um, can you speak to how redlining impacts one's health? Sure. Um, one of the things that we can certainly see right now is when we think about social determinants of health, 
And so according to the CDC, the definition is social determinants of health are the things that the place where the environment and conditions where we live, work, and play. So thinking about that, thinking about our physical environment, our neighborhood development, our social mobility, employment as such, access to food, um, safety, social contacts, and then your healthcare systems. So as we saw in some of the segments, if you're thinking about an area, a geographical region that has disinvestment or has not been invested in over time, um, as we think about generational wealth building up, if you've had disadvantages and there's no investment coming in, these things become concentrated. And so all of these things have an impact on people's health outcomes. Okay. and. Can you explain the link between cardiovascular disease and, and redlining, something that came up in our conversation? Sure, yeah, a study came out um, this summer and it was published in the Journal of American, um, by the Journal of American Medical Association. And what's really great about the study is that the sample size is 80,000 um, vets um, who access the VA system. So that's a really great uh, study because it kind of um, has a subpopulation that had healthcare access. Now, what they found is in looking at these veterans who had cardiovascular issues, such as stroke or um, cardiovascular uh, disease, uh, what they were able to see were that um, veterans who were living in typically uh, historically redlined areas had higher risk factors for cardiovascular disease, so such as chronic kidney disease, um, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and also then an increased factor and risk for cardiovascular disease itself. For some people who may be struggling to understand the connection, can you break it down how one's environment can lead them to not being as healthy as someone who lives somewhere else? Sure, absolutely. So when we think about your environment and just the conditions in which we live, work, and play, um, thinking about green space, thinking about um, if you're living somewhere close to pollutants, so such as say a freeway or industrial areas, train tracks or such, um, if you don't have um, transportation, if there are heavy reliance upon public transportation. Um, and those things impact your social mobility as well if you're thinking about your economic um, stability. If you are living somewhere that does has disinvestment, there may not be a major grocery store. Um, there may be some restrictions or access to health food, healthy foods. Uh, so we always think about, say, this term food deserts, but there's also another term such as food swamps, where there, perhaps there's a lot of food present, but it may be fast food, it may not be healthy options. And so things like this all compact over time, and they do impact people's access to health care, but also their health outcomes. Back to what you were talking about with the bias in appraisals. When we had spoke on the phone prior to this interview, you mentioned the efforts you go to when you are selling the home of an African-American family, and they were shocking to me. Will you explain what you do uh, to our viewers? Absolutely. Um, so it's actually a term called whitewashing, and essentially we whitewash the homes. So we remove all aspects that would give an appraiser an indication that someone black lived in this home. That might mean um, removing black art, you know, black family photos. Um, it could be books on the shelves. It, it, it encompasses what you call a home. We would literally take that from being a home and turn it into a house in order to secure their equity in the property. Why is that necessary? Well, I think that comes back to appraisers being predominantly older white men, which can typically come with some sort of bias. And our job is, the best that we can do, is to try to prepare the home to look less like there's someone black there to combat what we can do, right? There's policies and all sorts of things that need to be fixed. But from the standpoint of a real estate agent, what we can do is to try to remove the culture, essentially, out of the home so that there is no indication one way or the other what type of family lives there. Shantae, that can't sit well with you. It does not. It does not, but there has been such a loss in the black community because of appraisal bias and, and all out discrimination that we have to do what we can do to preserve 
that equity because that is the same equity that will be used to send kids to college, that will be used to um, open new businesses, become entrepreneurs. So there's such a bigger picture and there's so much in a black community that is weighed on their ability to get a home as well as their ability to sell it at its highest dollar. That, um that leads me to my question for you, Shantae, mm -hmm. about gener generational wealth and affording college. Mm -hmm. How did that show up in Chandler's story when you talk about building generational wealth, taking equity out and putting it in other places? Well, that comes down to our wealth gap um, and specifically to the gap between black home ownership and white home ownership. So as of 2022, our black home ownership rate nationally is at 45%. That's just slightly higher than it was in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was put into place. And it's actually lower than the 50% that was in place in about 2003. So as you can see, we've declined from that. But we know in general nationwide, home ownership is how people begin to have you know, other things like businesses and being able to send their kids to college. Now, without us being able to have that aspect, our children have the highest level of social of student loans and sometimes will skip college altogether because they know it would be a burden on themselves or their family. We also know that that is typically a reason why they can't get qualified for loans. Now, what I will say is a small win is before lenders would have to assess 1% of whatever their loan amount was. So if they had $100,000 in student loans, they would have to assess 1% of that towards a payment. Now that has been reduced down to half. So those who could not afford it because they were being dinged $1,000 a month for student loan, even if their payment was only $200, they were still required to have a payment of 1%. That has now been reduced to a half a percent, and that makes a major difference when it comes to black millennials who are purchasing the majority of homes by black people. It helps them when it comes to student loans, just like it did. Okay, and a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. How is Chandler's situation different from someone who may not be inheriting property? Typically, um, in white communities, they have plans set up to send their kids to college, but they also have the ability to pull from that equity to do something like that. But if you come from a household that doesn't have generational wealth through home ownership, you're having to find other opportunities to do that. And when you bring that back to appraisal bias, like Chandler, who would potentially be able to use the equity in the home to pay off his student loans, but if his appraisal is coming in lower because of the people who live in there or because of the area, like the historical West Side area, he could be getting far less for the home, even if he was to refinance. Jennifer, I want to go back to the health impacts of redlining. We talked about the lack of access to grocery stores, to parks in uh, historically redlined neighborhoods. What about access to health care? Oh, that's pretty significant. Um, so this becomes a burden for the residents that live there. So they're traveling further. You're also further from providers that may know what your situation is. It's very important, I think, particularly in medicine, that physicians have a, an understanding of what their patients are going through, what life is like beyond that exam room. So when you were thinking about having ha health care that's accessible right in your neighborhood, this means that you're having providers that know what's happening to you and know what your life is like when you step outside that door. So quickly, I think, you know, we can often hear in medicine, um, that patients are non-compliant. And so thinking about instead of non-compliance, they're unable to adhere. And it's maybe because of transportation or lack of transportation, challenges with transportation. Um, if someone is working a job that they may not have the time to take off work or taking off work is really very costly to them, then are you able to make up all these follow-up appointments if you have a transportation issue or you don't have your own vehicle? Are you then on the bus for several hours to make appointments, to go to appointments, even pharmacies? So when we think about healthcare, 
in a lot of low income neighborhoods, having a pharmacy that's local is challenging as well. So are you then able to have to take a special trip just to get refills on your meds? And that may be monthly. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about, um, you know, previously Nyoka and I was just even a conversation of like what a bus pass costs. So, you know, a bus pass for a month is about 60 odd dollars. And if you don't have it, you don't have it. That's, that's a lot of money, but it may be cheaper than to be like, okay, $2 a day. But taking a bus takes a lot of your time out of the day. And so having healthcare locally is, is significant. So as part of the city's revitalization plan for sure. the historic West Side, the 100 plan, uh, there are plans for a health care center, a wellness center. Richard Rothstein, though, brought up in our interview with him an important point that I'd like both of you to respond to. And he said, well, that's great. A, a health care center will certainly help. However, they're just going to be treating the symptoms of living in that neighborhood. The real solution is when you are getting people to move to healthier neighborhoods. Is that the case, do you think, Jennifer? I think it's a compound thing. So when we think about, I would say concentrated disadvantage is the term I would use. So if we have an area that's concentrated disadvantages, whether it be lack of grocery store transportation, um, uh, healthcare access, uh, economic opportunities, as we think about generational wealth building up, we think about this and the need complete other end of like the, the it gets more challenging to come out of this. Um, to his point, I would agree with him. When we think about spreading that out throughout a city, and when you're thinking about, say, economic mobility, opportunities, even exposure to things. Um, so, you know, and Shante could speak more to this, but affordable housing um, being distributed throughout the city, when we think about opportunity. Now, on the other end, not everyone can leave their neighborhood. And this doesn't mean that we should be giving up on neighborhoods. It doesn't mean that we should um, continue down the road of disinvestment. Um, I think places do need to have their own local grocery stores, their own local health care um, access, and you know, good quality public transportation. Um, but simply having people leave and be distributed throughout the city does nothing for the place that's left behind and the residents that are there. Shantae, what do you think? I think it would be very disheartening to say, you know, make it out. And I know we've talked about that before, about um, the goal of black community sometimes is just being able to make it out of that community. As if the only way for you to live healthy, to gain wealth, you know, to live like others is to completely leave the neighborhood. So I think that's the difference between equality and equity because just because every neighborhood has a grocery store doesn't mean that every neighborhood's grocery store is equal. And so that's why I think it's so important that you fix the community as well so that no matter where you are in your life, you have the ability to get the same thing whether you live in Summerlin or the historic West Side. And Jennifer, I wanna talk about the mental health impacts of redlining. There's been rumors that people on the West Side or who have roots on the West Side might have PTSD. Um, can you speak to, to that? So mental health and historically redlined areas is definitely, um, there is some alignment. So there's some research that's come out of um, family medicine. There's some research that's also come out of behavioral health looking at specifically you know, areas that are historically redlined. So when you think about these areas, these are areas that you know, may have high crime rates. So when you think about social context, you think about safety, you think about um, community. You know, are these communities fractured? Are, how are these communities, have they been exposed to or endured um, a lot of trauma and violence? Um, have individual, even at the individual levels, have members in that community been exposed to a lot of trauma and violence? Um, when then you think about the access to behavioral mental health services. So we all know that Nevada is, you know, ranks pretty low in this area, and this is a challenge for the state as a whole. But when you start looking at areas where um, folks have health disparities, where folks are in historically redlined areas or are living in concentrated areas of disadvantage, there's even less access to one physical health care, but also to mental and behavior health care as well. 
And we're running out of time. I, I just a couple more questions. Uh, Shantae, I want you to explain the impact of gentrification on redlined communities and how much is that happening in the historic West Side? Um, it's happening a lot. And the problem with gentrification is in order to renovate, you know, restore an area, they typically will bring in um, I always say as soon as you see a Starbucks, gentrification is coming, you know, because there's certain certain fast foods and different things in that area that are supposed to revitalize it. But the problem with that is once it's revitalized, the prices and the value go up in that area and then it displaces people's grandmothers, you know, and aunts and uncles who have lived there and owned their homes for 40 years it displaces them because they can no longer longer afford to live in the area that they grew up in. And you also had talked to me about people coming in, buying homes, and then renting them back to people who live there. How does that work? Why would that be the case? Um, so a lot of times, just um, as he had mentioned, they have homes that they haven't been able to maintain. And the issue with that is now predatory you know, to come and knock on a door and say, hey, you won't even need to leave. We'll come in, you know, we'll buy it from you, give you ten dollars or $20,000 for you to have it in your pocket, and we will fix it up for you, you know, and you can rent it back. Well, now we just took a homeowner with equity, generational wealth, and we've now taken that from them and put them in a situation where now they're just a renter. We could go on and on, but we've run out of time. <laughs> Nyoka Foreman will have extended coverage in this for the Nevada Independent. Meanwhile, thank you so much for watching and for any of the resources discussed, go to VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week.